There we go. Okay, so um, as, as I said, what I'm going to be undertaking here is um, a, a set of uh, steps within any logic that will build up a model of communicable disease. And I thought, roughly speaking, we would characterize um, this model in a fashion that's reminiscent of COVID-19. And over time, we could elaborate it in ways that capture additional richness. But like all things in the world, uh, like learning to walk, we, we, we start simple. We start one step at a time and in sort of a, a protected fashion. Um, so uh, we're gonna be building up the very simplest model uh, over the next hour. Um, but what we're gonna be building up is structure of the sort that's been published for COVID-19 early on. Um, you know, for, for sort of thought pieces exploring how might COVID-19 evolve um, uh, over time in, in terms of the, um, the, its spread. Uh, we're gonna base it off of Omicron, um, which emerged in late, uh, late November, um, and uh, which has uh, taken the world by storm and is currently fill, filled our hospitals and is going to do us in a bad way over coming weeks. So um, to do this, I'm going to call up any logic. Uh, so I am sharing my screen and uh, I'm running Linux. So I'm gonna start any logic from the command line as, as uh, we do in, in Linux, but you may, you will probably start it from a start menu or a menu bar in the bottom or, or whatever your operating system um, uses uh, to launch, launch programs. Now um, I'm gonna be running, um, the, the version that I have for the latest version of any logic is called the professional version. Um, this may lead to slight differences in coloration and, and you know, slight differences what you see, but it should be fairly immaterial for all the things will be undertaken um, during, uh, during this session. Um, so any, any logic's taking some time to come up. Um, and um, what you will probably see though, is something more like this. If you're coming, uh, coming up with it, you're bringing it up for the first time. It's something like this. Um, you'll probably see getting started, create a model, open examples, and so on. Now, um, does anyone recognize this environment? This environment might, might uh, be reminiscent to you of another environment you use for, say, Java programming. Um, can anyone tell me what it is? It begins with E, and it ends with E. Eclipse. Eclipse, yeah. This is an Eclipse-based environment. Any logic has basically shipped their package for building um, integrated hybrid models or independent models in those three dynamic modeling traditions, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation within the any logic frame. Um, now, when you're in this, um, uh, we have a, a rearrangeable interface. This is just the, the starting and, and some of you may find this kind of interesting. There's some uh, decent tutorials, some example models, uh, which span the gamut from, um, from health to manufacturing, um, to commercial, commercial side entities, to military and, and um, uh, issues with municipal governance, et cetera. Um, uh, issues like railroads and pedestrian flow. Um, so some may find that interesting and worthwhile, and I would highlight the, uh, the help system up here as well as uh, providing you some support. But for now, we're gonna dive into the modeling. Um, so I'm gonna minimize this and I'm gonna close all other, um, all other models. Um, and uh, what you should see is, is broadly something that looks a bit like this. Over here on the left, you have uh, a projects menu. Um, and you have a palette menu. Now you can drag these things around and you know position them next to each other. For example, um, you can uh, eliminate them and bring them back with uh, with this view menu up here, and generally rearrange the space as you see fit. But generally speaking, I'm going to have um, a uh, course project or the projects over here on the left. Um, and I'm gonna have a palette uh, here as well. And I'm going to, uh, to have properties. The projects will allow me to explore a model. And I'm going, to, I'm going to build a model from scratch here, okay? So I'd like you to get in this position um, and 
you can do file new and I'll say new model, okay? And it will say, um, you know, uh, Omicron um, S, uh, you know, SEIR, that stands for susceptible infected and uh, it's susceptible exposed infected recovered um, one, or maybe we'll say V1 for version one, okay? Um, and importantly, you're gonna set the model time units. These are dynamic models. They're models of dynamics over, of, of dynamics, um, models of behavior over time, um, which we call the model dynamics. Um, remember that models uh, provide a kind of simplified description of things in the world for a certain purpose, but um, they do so in a way here for simulation models that are and dynamic models that are runnable. We can actually say, what if that's true? What are the implications over time? You know, go figure. Uh, go figure out what what a model with this structure and this these set of assumptions about that structure would cause in terms of behavior. So we're going to pick um, a time unit in which that behavior is going to be expressed. Um, it's not that the model is going to jump between times, um, you know, that are this far apart. It's that this is kind of our yardstick of what does one mean? Is it one day? Does it mean one year? Does it mean one month? Um, it sort of picks our time unit. And I'm going to say days, okay? Uh, for COVID-19, days is kind of a, a familiar time unit by which to express things. Um, but we're going to have to keep that into account when it comes to things like rates that we're specifying. Okay, and uh, once we specified these things, Omicron, SEIR version one and days, um, you notice it's going to a certain place you can finish, okay? And it's gonna go kind of build, build up our model and probably show you a palette. I'm gonna go back here, okay? Um, so, so it's built for us the basic um, skeleton of a model. Um, Maine is gonna be kind of the global environment. It's gonna be the, the overall, um, top level representation of the model. Later, when it comes to agent-based modeling, for example, we're gonna have many other things like agents that circulate, maybe people and, and you know, physicians and, and uh, might have hospitals and schools and long-term care facilities. But for now, we're just gonna have, have main here. And this X is gonna be a simulation. It's gonna be an, ex an experiment or a, and that's why it's called X. I prefer to call it a scenario, uh, which we can use to kind of ask the model what if questions. You know, if, we, if it's a status quo scenario, what will happen, um, you know, if we just undertake business as usual over the next few months? And then we may have a what if scenario, what if the provincial government put into place gathering restrictions or what if it um, increased the efficiency of contact tracing or what if it could have a, you know, a big um, uh, boost a campaign to roll out booster vaccinations um, uh, for all el eligible ages? Um, or what if we could use Paxlovid to treat cases more quickly? Those what if questions could be asked in different scenarios. And each scenario would set the model up with different assumptions about like how quickly cases are found or whether or not we can treat people who are in early stages of illness with Paxlovid to sort of decrease the severity of their symptoms and antiviral. Um, okay, but let's let's jump into this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, from this seat, I spoke with you um, during our last class um, about the craft of modeling. And, and I've noted that models, um, when people think models, they think data. And a lot of people um, get very caught up in the data thing. They think a model is defined by the data. Garbage in, garbage out, you know, if you don't know the data, you're not gonna, you're gonna get nonsense out of the model. And um, those, when it comes to dynamic models, those comments are pretty glib because there's a lot more to a model than data. Can anyone here let me know what's, what's something else that is very central to the model for dynamic modeling? Those three types we saw, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation, all are centrally about something much more than data. What is that thing? Does anyone wanna say? Want to venture an idea? Is it time? Yeah, it's about time. And, and it's behavior over time.
but it's about something which drives that behavior. We say something drives behavior. Does anyone know what that thing is? It begins with an S, ends with an E. It has a T and an R in it. Structure. Structure drives behavior. These models are about structure, ladies and gentlemen. They're about capturing structure in the world, the structure of processes, like the progression of how people go through stages of COVID-19 and how, how one person will transmit to another based on being in a certain stage. A susceptible won't transmit to a susceptible. Uh, an exposed won't even transmit to a susceptible, but an infective, ah, now that can transmit to a susceptible. This is all about structure. Models are about a lot more than data. The data often just kind of tunes um, what comes out of the model. The structure is often what foundationally determines what comes out of the model, the behavior that emerges from it. And it, it's a complete fiction for some, as some people say, um, uh, you know, what, what some people will say is a complete fiction that, you know, you, you can make uh, a model do anything with, with uh, by putting in different data. That's complete nonsense with dynamic models because structure constrains that behavior. Um, structure is about how things work. Um, the ways, the sort of the, the regularities in, in how things work in the world. Here we're dealing with structure of processes, like the stages they go through. And it's not true that by changing the data about it, anything can result. Often it really, really constrains what's possible for a model, the structure. So let's put into place, ladies and gentlemen, some structure for this model. Now for system dynamics, does anyone remember how we encode structure? There's two main building blocks of structure with system dynamics. Does anyone remember what they are? for quantitative system dynamics. We saw causal loop diagrams, which are kind of model maps. But after that, we built up a model out of two big basic building blocks. Anyone remember? Stocks and flows. Stocks and flows. Stocks and flows it is. Um, so um, let's go to the palette. And we'll find that in the palette, we have our choices of a wide variety of possibilities here. Um, I'm going to pick here the system dynamics palette, which looks uncomfortably like a bomb or something here. Um, they really got to improve their, their iconography, but it's, it's this one here and mine is just underneath the fluid library, okay? Um, which is more like sort of shipping around oil and stuff like that. Um, okay, so system dynamics palette, and there we go, stocks and flows. But there's some other supporting features, sort of bit characters that, that play a role in the background, um, dynamic variables, which can be used to total up or perform calculations, perform formulas involving other structures, um, ultimately stocks and flows in the model, uh, parameters, which specify assumptions, and links, which indicate dependency. Links L-I-N-K, not L-I-L-Y-N-X. Uh, We'll be talking about lynxes and hares at some point in the model. Okay, so we're going to add structure. We're going to impose structure in a model. We're going to characterize COVID-19 at the most high level in a way people did in the opening days of the pandemic, including someone who speaks with you even now. Um, and uh, a model not too different from what we're gonna be building up. Um, more elaborate for sure, but um, in this theme uh, was used to make the earliest decisions the province made um, to head off uh, catastrophic loss of life uh, from the original wave in this province. So what I did is I dragged in a stock to Maine. I went over here um, to this palette and I clicked and I dragged it in um, and released it over here in, in Maine. I'm, I'm adding this to me. And what I'm gonna call this is, you notice there's a little label there and I'm gonna say susceptible, okay? Um, uh, so these are gonna indicate people who are, they don't have COVID-19 now. In fact, they haven't had it. They're susceptible to it. They can be infected. The fact that this is, is sort of uh, highlighted means I can kind of drag it around and and position it as I see fit. And I'm gonna position it down here, okay? Um, uh, 
Next, I'm going to drag over and I'm going to put in place one that's called uh, infective. Okay. Now I'm going to be positioning them about three of these bars apart. And I, if I were more artful, I would have dragged it. You can either start typing this, except this can be called exposed. What am I, what am I saying? Infective. Uh, exposed. Um, this is going to reflect the fact that initially when people get infected, the very, you know, six hours later, a day later, um, a day and a half later, they're not actually, they can't transmit the infection. The virus is multiplying on them really quickly, um, particularly for Omicron and, and the upper respiratory tract, less so in the lower. Um, although there's some healthy debate about this right now, the extent of that. Um, but uh, the, uh, they're not able to transmit it. They're not able to spread it. There's no contagion yet. So we call them exposed. They're exposed. They're actually infected, but they're not infective. They're not infectious um, would be another way to put it. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to drag that down there. Um, and uh, then I'm going to go and, and uh, once again, sort of three, um, I, I should be more careful about this. Um, um, I should have done this two, two of these apart. Sorry, folks, um, I'm not being, being careful. Um, uh, I'll call this infectious um, or, or infective would be another, another way um, we could have called it. Um, the spacing is just kind of nice when you start dragging flows in. And I, I think it's two, two lengths that the default flow length is. So you could just kind of dock it immediately. It's, it's really not too important. And then I'm gonna drag another one called recovered, recovered. You notice that I'm, I'm using nouns here. This is like recovered people or infectious people or exposed people, or I guess their adjectives are susceptible. These are kind of the nouns of the, um, um, of the uh, of, of the world. So we think of it susceptible people, exposed people, that these uh, stocks serve as kind of the nouns. The action occurs at what? Can anyone say where, where's the action occur? It's in the other building block, which is the what? It is the, begins with the F. Oh. Um, flow, flow, that's the verbs. Um, oh, it's three, it's three, it's three. I should have been more careful. Okay, let's let's go position them. Three apart, sorry. I, I knew this in my youth. I knew, well, a few years ago, I knew this uh, inside out. And these days, I'm, um, I'm, I'm more often modifying models and building them up. So we're gonna drag in flows uh, into here. And there we go. Um, flow, and this is gonna be infection, okay? It's not a big deal if you drag it in. Let's suppose they're not three separated. Watch this. I, I called it infection. I just typed that in. And I'm going to drag one in here, um, and it's not going to reach over. And I'm going to say this is um, uh, what's a nice way to um, uh, say this. Um, so uh, uh, becoming infectious. How, how's that? Um, we would, uh, we might say um, um, completing latency in more technical terms. If you get this, if it, you notice it's going to a, a, a cloud and you can simply drag this over and it will kind of unify it, will identify it and, and it will make it go to this, uh, to this stock here. Um, so if, if you have it disconnected, it's not a big deal. I, it's just one of the reasons I'd like to lay these out three apart, okay. Um, and this is recovery, okay? Um, okay. These are the verbs, um, these, these flows. That's where the action is. They're going from susceptible to exposed. They're going from exposed to infectious. Um, uh, so th they're becoming infectious and then they'll be in this state for a while and they'll go on to recover. So each of these boxes, which you could resize by the wire, by the way, to your heart's content, um, each of these boxes is called a stock, um, or alternatively, it's called a level variable. Um, and uh, each of those stocks represents an accumulation of people, a sort of group of people, a, a pool of people, as it were. Um, all the people in there are considered um, kind of interchangeable, and we're not making distinctions within that. Um, we're simply counting the number that are in each of these states. 
the, the, the appearance is not material here, okay? Um, and uh, what we're going to do now, um, well, maybe you could tell me uh, what we're going to do. Um, uh, what information is missing that would be needed to turn this into a runnable model? Is this model runnable now? now? The answer is no. Why not? What, what, what are some in pieces of information that I need to give it um, to make it runnable? There's two primary pieces of information that are currently lacking from it. Anyone want to venture? Uh, do you need any uh, loops like plus and minuses uh, from one place to, okay. to okay. the end? Okay, and what are those? Uh, what are those feedbacks? Links? Yeah, feedbacks. Okay, those loops are associated with feedbacks. So those are kind of the same basic idea. And those feedbacks reflect aspects of structure. They depict, reflect dependencies. What depends on what? So we need to, in fact, indicate those dependencies and, in fact, indicate how it depends on it, like um, particularly for flows. Okay, this is all very nice, but how many people are recovering per day? You know, that, that's an important thing if we're going to simulate it. Right now, it just kind of labels it recovery, and, and that's nice, but it that, that tells us something about the structure here. This, this is structure. It's, it's telling us that, you know, COVID-19, um, as it's depicted in this model, proceeds in four basic stages. Um, and you proceed from one to the next stage in a kind of linear sort of way. That's communicating something really important about the structure, but it's not precise enough to allow for simulation, right? That it's not precise enough to allow it to say exactly how many people are gonna go from infectious to recover in a given time. Is it very, very few? Is it a lot? Uh, if there's a thousand people in infectious, how many recover in the next day? It, there's no way it could figure this out from what we specified. So that's one piece of information. What's the other piece of information that's needed? I'll give you a hint. It's about the stocks. It's about these levels. It's about the, these pools of people, these accumulations of people. What's missing here? The initial value. So... The initial value. That's exactly it. Um, we need to specify the initial value. After we specify an initial value, what is it that determines how this changes over time. Do we have to specify a formula for this uh, stock for how it changes over time? Yeah, because people who may begin susceptible aren't going to stay susceptible okay. after they've become exposed, infectious, recovered. Good, but where does that formula get encoded? Where does that need to be specified? It needs to be specified for this stock or for this flow. It's actually for this flow. So you're right. There is a formula needed, but it's actually not a, uh, it's not associated with the, the stock. You notice if you look at the stock, it actually fills in the formula for it. But the formula is going to lead to the stock's evolution are going to be the flows into and out of it. In this case, there's only one. This one has two, right? One coming in, one coming out. The formulas for these flows, which are part of that the feedbacks and the dependencies I talked about, those will dictate the evolution of the stocks. The evolution of the stocks is dictated by the flows into and out of it. And the values of those flows are determined by ultimately by the value of the what? It's a dynamical system. So the behavior at any one time is determined by the what of the system. Anyone? The begins with an S, ends with an E. It has two T's in it. There's an A in the middle. Uh, Dorian says state. The state of the system. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's the state of the system dictates it. And what is it here that captures the state of the system? If we're looking at this, where's the state of the system? If we froze the system at any one time, what information would we need to, to restart it? It will be entirely specified by the what? By the... Stocks. Uh, stocks. Stocks. Thanks. I was thinking of threatening. I'm not going to breathe until someone gives an answer. Um, but that could lead to <laughs> you know, an abrupt end to the course. So uh, yeah, so it's the stocks. The stocks summarize the state. That's the current situation. And the values of the flows, how the stocks will change over the next little bit is entirely dictated 
by the value of the state, the, the stocks. Um, and how those stocks will change over the next little bit is about determined by those values of the flows. You know, remember that yin yang symbol I, I wrote, but um, it, this, is, this is what you see in, across all of these dynamic modeling methods. The state of the system right now dictates its evolution. Um, so let's get, let's get cracking. So let's go do the first stuff first. Um, for susceptible, let's put in here a, um, a value, okay, um, for this. Now, I could hard code this value, but I'm a self-respecting software engineer. I don't like to litter my, my code uh, or my models uh, with, with magic numbers, with just constants put in there, because I can't see the dependency. Instead, I'd like to specify an assumption. And assumptions are specified and communicated any logic by parameters. So let's drag in a parameter. And it's going to be called um, uh, total um, uh, population. Maybe we'll call it population size. Population size. All one word. Okay. This is Java beneath the, the scenes. And if you put a space in there, all hell will break loose. Uh, you can put an underbar in there, but I prefer camel case. So I'm going to say population size, okay? And the total population size is going to be 1.2 million. Um, so one, two, zero, 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 zero. Okay, so that's 1.2 million people in our fair province, but increasingly damaged province of Saskatchewan. Um, uh, being ravaged right now by, by Omicron. Um, so population size, 1.2 million. Alternatively, if you want to use um, scientific notation, you could do 1.2 E6. And I, I apologize for this dumb any logic bug that we still haven't fixed. 1.2 1 E6, if you want to. 1.2 times 10 to the 6, um, if you prefer that. Um, I, I think it's kind of nice. I don't have to count zeros. Um, OK. So that's the total population size. This encodes an assumption. And that assumption will be able to be modified for different scenarios. Remember I told you this X means a scenario. So for some scenarios, I might assume Saskatchewan's population. Otherwise, I might assume Alberta's population or Quebec's population or Ontario's um, by just changing the assumption about population size. You notice when I've specified that, if I go to one of these these scenarios, it allows me to make alternative assumptions about the parameters. What I specified there was just the default. And you notice it says default value. In general, I can modify a parameter's assumption. And parameters serve to both encode assumptions and communicate them. They communicate them from the next level up. The next level up to main is the experiment. The experiment will tell main, assume this and in the in the in main will say yes ma'am and it'll go and, and execute it. it it doesn't always speak that out loud there there should be an option to get it to say yes ma'am but um they haven't added that to the menu system okay so population size now let's go to the stocks and start filling them in so the initial susceptible is going to be guess what the population size minus one okay now um, I'll say population size minus 1.0, okay? Um, uh, and, oh, it's saying, okay, uh, it's used but not expected. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean it's not expected? And why can't I put, put that in there? Well, the fact is that it's, it tends to be fairly, fairly picky, okay? Um, and particularly any logic gives you a set of choices here that are based on the dependencies. And what are the dependencies here? You have to indicate them with a link. And so you notice there's this link in here in palettes. In the palette, there's a link. So if you go and you pull this link in and you can connect it up to the, uh, to the population size. Now that says, honest to goodness, susceptible now depends on population size and that's what this visual depiction indicates. And that's important for stakeholders and for modelers to visually have an abstraction of the model that says, oh, what depends on what? You don't wanna to have to look at all the details at once. 
And sometimes just look at the model and say, oh, that depends on that and that depends on that. Yeah, that makes sense. That allows you to spot errors. It allows you to get a clarity on why you see certain model behavior um, and knowing what the assumptions are behind the model. So we use these, um, these visual representations in terms of these links. And any logic is fairly particular about it. Um, some might say sometimes even picky -yoon. Um, uh, So we'll, we'll have to adhere to that, okay? But the formula for the susceptible is given by population size minus one. And it's a happy camper because they added that, that link, that stinking link, okay? Actually, it's not stinking, it's a beautiful link. Just remember that. Um, okay, so, um, so let's, uh, let's get on here. Let's go to exposed. Um, maybe we'll start with one person exposed. So it's like someone has flown in, maybe, maybe you know, it's a lull after Omicron. There's some good reason to think there might be a, a six to nine month lull after Omicron. Um, there's a competing hypothesis, but I won't get into it. Um, there's two competing hypotheses if people listen to my talk from two days ago. But, um, but let's suppose there's a lull and all COVID-19 uh, you know, disappears in the province for a while. But then someone comes in with this new bug, um, this new lineage. Um, and uh, so we start with one person exposed. They're not infective yet, but soon enough, um, as the night falls today, they'll become infectious. Um, so we'll start with one person here. We'll start with zero people infectious. I'll say 0.0, .0 uh, to be sort of to mark that I've changed it and 0, 0.0. There we go. Okay, so I'm specifying the initial value for each of these. And from then on, so what is it? It's population size minus one for the first, 1.0 for the second, zero for this one and zero for that one. We have our model structure, ladies and gentlemen. That's the most important thing uh, overall. We have the, the highest level model structure. That actually dictates um, the speed with which things play out over time. If, if you wanna understand, why, um, oh gosh, I don't, I, don't, I don't have it up, but if, if you wanna go look at that canvas posting um, uh, that I made and you look at some of those uh, Twitter commentary on it and, and some of those postings of results, you'll notice um, that uh, there's uh, a long time between when the number of cases in the hospital rise and when they uh, fall. Um, so if you go look at Dennis Kendall, a colleague who is the CEO of Health Quality Council for a while, and you look at these and you're wondering like, why is it so long? Why is this falling? Um, and it doesn't get to near today's level till after the end of February. It's because of the structure of the system. It takes time for people to go through stages. And if someone's in the ICU for four weeks on average before they can be discharged, it takes time to, to, you know, for that bed to become free. Um, it takes time for it to die down, just like it takes time for your bathtub to drain after you've taken a bath. Um, if, the, if the drain is, you know, small or if it's partly clogged. Um, okay, so we, we've got structure. We've got initial state of the model. Now we have to dictate the rules that govern that state, that, fill in the rest of these verbs. And that too is an aspect of structure. Let's start with a simple one, okay? We'll start with, in fact, two simple ones. Um, this is gonna be the one that's gonna take the most time and we'll leave that to last once you've gotten a bit of facility here. So we're gonna first capture people's going from infectious to recovered state, how long that takes. That's really important. One of the big challenges in bringing down those numbers here is the fact that it's really hard to discharge someone who's infectious back to the community. If you have someone who's caught the bug in the hospital, maybe they don't need a hospital bed anymore. They're called an alternative level of care, ALC patient. Um, maybe you know they went through hip surgery and they're ready to be discharged except they're infectious. Good luck finding a place that's gonna take them. You think you're gonna take them into their home and have home care look after that person and potentially catch the bug from them? No way. You think you're gonna discharge them to a long-term care facility? No, they don't want an outbreak. You're gonna put them in a rehab unit? No way, they're not gonna take a COVID positive patient. So where do they sit? 
They don't need the hospital bed for their operation anymore, but they have to sit in the hospital. And because of that, guess what? No one, can, the, someone can't come in from the emergency. And that's why we have lines out the door from emergency in minus 25 degree weather. Um, Okay, so let's 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 go let's go put in these assumptions. It, it matters. It, tuning those parameters matters, but the fact that we have this structure leads to some of these long delays. It leads to regularities. Regularities in the model structure lead to regularities in the dynamics. So let's go see it. Okay. Um. So let's go uh, put this in. And I know we're going to make use here of a structure called a first order delay, okay? And, and this is part of um, this notion of, of compartmental models, okay? A first order delay is a situation where we have inputs coming in um, uh, at whatever rate, and then we have an outflow that occurs uh, in a way that's proportional to the value of the stock. And this is very common. We see it in two ways. We see it, we have a certain rate of proceeding like a mortality, we have a population, there's a certain chance per year, or in our case, per day of someone dying. Alternatively, we can phrase this, and, and in that case, the rate here, which is of unit one over time, is multiplied by the population to get a value for the flow. Whatever the unit is of this population, say you're measuring it in single persons, the, the unit for this flow out is gonna be persons per unit time. Um, uh, that's that's the relationship between stocks and flows. Um, uh, if you have flows in or out of a stock, um, the flows are going to be always associated with the unit. The unit for the flows will be the unit of the stock divided by the time unit, um, because the stock is kind of totaling them up uh, over time. Um, that's the rate of change. It's the depopulation dt, um, the rate of change how many people per unit time are leaving the stock is the rate associated with the flow out. And that's measured in whatever, however we measure the stock divided by time. In this case, we have a mortality rate that's of unit one over time. We multiply it by the stock to get something of whatever the, the um, unit is of population, say person uh, divided by time. So it's this minus alpha P, minus the mortality rate times the stock. By contrast, we can phrase it in terms of a mean lifetime. This is an average amount of time they spend, whoa, in that stock. We call it, let's say tau here. And the value of the flow here is the population divided by tau. Tau is a constant. Um, and so the net effect of this is multiplying again, this population times one over tau. Um, which is, is a constant. And it turns out that, that if you have a rate, the mean time in the stock is one over the rate. Um, uh, tau equals one over alpha. Um, the mean, like if you specify a rate, like uh, I have a 1% chance per day of, of dying, then my average amount of time alive is 100 days. If I have a 10% chance of dying per day, God forbid, if I have 0.1 chance of dying per day, my average time alive is 10 days. If I have a 0.5 chance of dying, there's a hit man right outside of my, 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 my house here or something like that. I have an average, uh, I have an average time alive of two days. Um, you know, if he doesn't get me the first day, there's a really good chance he'll get me the second day, right? Um, uh, it's like each day of a kick of the can of getting hit by the hit man. <laughs> okay, that's probably the weirdest sentence I've ever said, but never mind. Um, but the point is, uh, I get trolled, but it's not that bad yet. Um, so uh, this is alpha p. Um, this alpha, the, uh, viewed as a rate, a first order delay, has a rate value that's one over the mean time in it. So if you give me a rate, I can figure out how long they are in this stock on average. It's one over the rate. Or if you give me an average amount of time they're in there, I could say the rate of leaving the per day chance of leaving is one over the rate tau. Okay, um, so this is called a first order delay. What distinguishes it as a first order delay is the outflow. The outflow is just the value of the outflow at any one time. How many people per unit time are leaving here? Like people per day are leaving here is, is equal to the number of people here times some constant. 
the constant is one over tau if you phrase it as a mean time tau or it's times alpha if you phrase it as a rate. OK, so let's use that. Let's say there's a mean time someone's infectious. OK, there we go. That's a parameter. That's an assumption. That be an assumption. OK, so um, uh, mean, we'll say mean time um, uh, uh, infectious. OK, um, fine. Um, I tend to call it mean time to recovery, but, but that's fine. Mean time infectious. Mm. Um, one of the reasons is maybe they die instead, and, and there's a difference between for those who recover, what's their mean time to recovery versus mean time infectious. But we'll, here we'll call it mean time infectious. And I'm going to link that up to this flow because it's going to depend on it. The other thing, this flow, given that it's a first order delay like that, what else does it depend on? Can anyone riddle me this? What else does this depend on except this parameter? It depends on one other thing, really importantly. There ain't going to be no recovery unless there's what? Infectious. Somebody infectious. There's got to be someone who is infectious for them to recover. If there's nobody here, there's going to be no one going down. If there's a million people here, there's going to be a lot of people coming down here. If there's one person here, it's going to be very few. If there's zero, it's going to be zero people coming down. So of course, it's got to depend on this. The values of the flows depend on the values of the stocks at any one time. How many people are coming down depends on the state of the system. Um, that, that was almost the definition of a dynamic system. Its behavior at any one time depends on its state. And this is a direct expression of that. So I'm going to stick, stick in a, a link between the, the stock and the flow. And you see that link there. Okay, It's saying this flow depends on two things, the mean time infectious and on the number of people infectious. If there isn't anyone infectious, that's an element of state. No one's going to be coming down here. If there's tons, lots of people are going to be coming down here. But it depends on this mean time. And given what I just told you about first order delays and the two different ways of phrasing them, um, one in terms of a mean time and one in terms of a rate, what is, can anyone tell me? What is the formula here have to be for this flow? What is this formula going to be? Anyone? This is a mean time they spend, and that's it. So what does this formula have to be? An exponential. OK, it's going to yield an exponential behavior in this. This is true. But the formula is actually going to depend linearly on this value. And how is it going to depend linearly? This is a first order delay, ladies and gentlemen. I'm asking actually a, a question whose answer is staring you in the face. This is a first order delay. We're not worried about the flow in right now. All we're worried about is the flow, flow out. And if we have a parameter that's a mean amount of time you spend in the stock, this says what the form of this flow is. What's the, this, this red, this pink, is showing what's the formula for this thing. Well, it's the value of the stock divided by this mean lifetime. So how does that apply here? This is a very basic question. How does this apply here? What is the formula here? Anyone? This is the first order delay of exactly this form. Yes, uh, divided yeah. infectious period. Yes, yes, exactly. It's just number infectious, OK? Div and that's our P here. Right, that's our P, our population, and the population, that's our P, um, uh, divided by the mean time. Okay, um, so it's divided by mean time infectious. Um, and you can do control space or option space, I think it is a max or mumble, maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's uh, command space. I, I I can't remember. On on max, it's some key, and you 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 specify it out. Okay. Um, and this is just the application of this rule. This is a first order delay. If it's phrased in terms of a mean lifetime in that stock, which is exactly how this is phrased, 
the formula for this is the value of the stock divided by this thing. And that's exactly what we have here, okay? Exactly that. Um, it's the value, the formula for this is this divided by that. The formula for this is this divided by that, okay? And, and that's why we have this formula here. Okay. Um, Professor, could I ask a quick question? Can, yeah. Um, why do we not have a stock for dead? We, we uh, could, we're not adding this yet because we haven't added hospitalization yet um, and serious cases. We're building up the simplest possible model and, and adding to it. And for Omicron, the number of people who die from Omicron is actually pretty, pretty, pretty modest, but it does happen with unvaccinated people. Um, it's just at one tenth the rate of the original, um, the original, oh, sorry, of Delta. Uh, one tenth rate of delta. Delta was twice already, roughly the rate of um, the original type. So it does happen. We will add to this model. We'll be adding hospitalization. We'll be adding asymptomatics, or you'll be adding some of these on your own. Um, and death will be in there, but I haven't added it yet. But it's a good question. Thinking about the scope of the model is, is an important question. So good. I like that. Okay. If If you prefer, you could think of this as removed people. They're either recovered or they're removed um, from, the, from the model um, uh, dynamics um, in terms of uh, you know, interaction with others or what have you. Um, OK. Um, there's some subtle differences there we'll, we'll talk about. But, um, OK, so are people comfortable with this? this? What this is saying is people here are leaving with a mean time of this. If, if you spend an average of 10 days infectious, um, you're, you know, let's suppose there's a thousand people infectious right now. Um, and the average time you're infectious is 10 days. Let's fill that in as our default value, 10. Okay, I, I didn't specify it before, but let's fill it in as 10.0, okay? Um, if, if, if this time is 10.0 days, on average, you're there, and you have a thousand people here per day, you have about a thousand divided by 10 or a hundred people per day recovering, which makes sense, right? Um, those thousand people over the course of 10 days will be drained um, about a hundred a day going out at, at first. Um, and, and so it makes sense that one tenth of them leave per day. Um, you know, so our mean time infectious is 10. Um, if it's 10, we have about 10% of them leaving per day. And that's why this flow is kind of the stock divided by 10. It would indicate if you have a thousand people infectious, you have about a hundred people per day leaving, okay? And by the way, this mean time infectious is per day, okay? Um, it's, uh, we could actually mark it as being in, uh, in some amount of time and choose time to be days, but we won't get into that right now. Uh, yes, Larissa, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, I'm curious, should should mm -hmm. um, recovery also impact infectious then? Because if we're losing 10 from infectious, shouldn't it go down? Or is that done like somehow? Uh, we'll, we'll be seeing exactly where that comes in in a little okay. bit. That's what's going to go in here. Um, that's why I'm leaving it for last, OK? OK. Uh, and you'll see exactly how it gets in there. Um, okay, so same basic idea we're going to use um, for this flow here, okay? So we're going to have a um, mean um, time. Uh, we could call it exposed. The, the actual term of art is, um, is mean latent time meaning it's the time before they develop symptoms. It's actually subtly different from incubation time, which is time till, till symptoms, but um, we'll call it mean latent time. And uh, we're gonna specify that as um, uh, here as uh, four, four um, no, two days, two days, okay? Um, for Omicron, it's actually quite quick. It's a bit speedier than, than previous um, variants of concern. And, we're gonna drag in a link from that to here. And we're gonna drag in a link from, because this has to depend also on the number of people exposed. If there's nobody 
who's in the exposed state right now, it's going to be zero people coming down here, right? If there's nobody to go, we can't have anyone going. And it depends on this time. Um, so this is a mean latent time. I specified two days for this. I had specified 10 days for this. I'll say 2.0 um, to be make it very clear. I'm speaking about a, a real number um, uh, or double precision value. And the value here for this flow, um, the formula for this flow, can anyone tell me what is it going to be? Learning from this or learning from this principle. Once again, we have something that's measured in terms of a mean time to leave. And we have a stock and we're filling in this formula. Um, this is the general form of the formula. It's population divided by this mean time in there. So what's the formula gonna be for this? Anyone? What's this formula gonna be? So would it be exposed divided by mean latent time? Exactly. Exposed by mean latent time. If each day you have, oh, sorry, if, if you're in that for an average of two days, if you have 10 people in it, it's about five people are going to leave per day, right? You have 10 people in here. Takes two days for them to leave on average, but half of them are going to leave in that first day. Um, so it makes sense that it's this over that. It also makes sense dimensionally. The, the, the units of this, uh, if, if you measure people as people, then this is going to be in people per day coming in and people per day leaving. Um, and for this to be people per day, you need people multiplied by something that's, or divided by something that's number of days. This is number of days, mean latent time. Time here is measured in days. So this is, this is gonna be in people per day. That's what this formula gives. If it were, if it were times, it wouldn't make sense. It'd be like we have people days uh, flowing out, which doesn't make sense. Um, we need people per day, okay? Um, Okay, oh, wow. Oh, man, I'm running the model. I didn't mean to do that. Um, okay, really exciting things are happening, but, but that's for a few minutes from now. That's not quite yet. Okay, so we filled in most of the flows of our model. We only have one to go. Now, this one is, um, this one is, is the most tricky because it involves transmission. And I'm gonna have to walk you through it. And we're gonna have to make quick action here, okay? Because time is, is clicking down. Um, some people may want to go a few minutes extra to, to see it, it completed, but we're, we're getting very close to being able to complete this model and watch it run. Okay, so I'm gonna drag in. So this flow, the number of people getting infected per day, that depends on a bunch of things. Larissa said one of the things that depends on earlier, which is you know, it, it's got to depend something about how many people are infectious. And as Larissa pointed out, people are no longer infectious. They shouldn't be infecting others. How are we going to capture that? We have to capture the fact that the more infectious people there are, the, the more people, more of these susceptibles, these, each susceptible will be at higher risk of getting infected. Somehow we have to capture that if there's no infectious people around, a susceptible will be in no danger of getting infected. If there's almost everyone around them is infectious, they're gonna be at high risk of getting infected. So surely, ultimately this flow needs to depend on infections. Okay, what else does it have to depend on? Well, it has to depend on how frequently they have contact with other people. And if they do have contact, um, you know, are they wearing a mask? Are they washing their hands frequently? In other words, um, how likely is that, that a given contact will lead to, to them actually getting the bug? Um, uh, are they, will later see vaccination with this very model um, uh, in, in capturing that, which will make them less likely to get infected. Um, will also make them less likely to get hospitalized later. Um, so let's take this and, and we'll add these factors in. So the first thing I'm going to do is to actually add in a parameter that's going to be contacts um, per person per day, okay? Um, you could say contacts per day and, and 
and that will be fine. It's just, it, it, it helps me clear the units sometimes if you say contacts per person per day, because it's unit is actually one over day. It's like the frequency, the number they have per day. And the contacts per day uh, that we're going to make use of here are going to be 15 on average. So this is actually mean contacts per day. This is gonna be important when we get to agent-based modeling. Mean contacts, that doesn't mean they're nasty contacts, you know, that they're mean-spirited and cruel. No, it, it means that they are, it means the average contacts per day. Okay, that, that if we consider a susceptible, some of more, some of less, and this is kind of, if we consider across the susceptibles, you know, what's, what's the average number of people they have a contact per day enough to transmit? We're, we're gonna say 15, okay? Um, okay, um, and now um, we're going to put in, uh, so, so we're gonna have contacts. Now we're gonna need to figure out for susceptible, if we want to figure out how much they're at risk for those contacts, we have to consider two things. First thing is how many of those contacts are actually with infectious people? Because after all, if they have contact with other susceptibles, I mean, big whoop, right? I mean, they're not going to get infected. If they have contacts with recovered people or even exposed people, they're not going to get infectious. It's only when they're with infectious people. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what fraction of those contacts are going to be with infectious people? And how we're going to do it is we're going to, we're going to make a simplifying assumption. We're going to change this in the future, uh, particularly for agent-based models. We're going to ask what fraction of the total population, the whole model, what, uh, what fraction of the total population is, is uh, infectious? We already have a total population size here, OK? Um, and what we're going to do now is total up, uh, we're gonna figure out the fraction that are infectious. So we're gonna say fraction infectious. There's actually a special word for this in epidemiology. It's called the prevalence of infection, but I'm not gonna use it right now for, for this tender hearted audience. I'm gonna call it fraction infectious, okay? Um, and um, maybe we'll put it up here um, just, thinking about our screen real estate. And I'm gonna put population size up here as well for, for, for reasons of, of art. Um, and can anyone give me a, a fraction infectious? What does that depend on? Can anyone say? Surely, what would that depend on? Can anyone give me a formula involving the population size and anything else in the model that would tell me what fraction of the people of the model are infectious, anyone? The infectious divided by population size. Good, good, exactly. Well, let's let's move this over here a little bit, and we're gonna drag in a link to indicate that this depends on this. There we go. Hey, look at that. Um, and and it's gonna depend on population size as well. Um, notice I could have, I, I could have actually just totaled up the the susceptible exposed infected recover and gotten population size but because i already specified it i'll i'll just kind of use that okay and fraction infectious this is needs to be specified by formula this is what's called a dynamic variable this is something which varies over time based on other aspects of state it's calculated at any one time instantaneously based on other things in the model so larissa what did you say it is what's the formula for this it's infectious divided by population size. Yeah, so I'm going to start typing it, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to say infectious control space to that divided by population size. Right um, there we go, um, and it's a happy camper because we have these arrows pointed that that connect it up and that show what it depends on what it depends, which is. Nice, when someone looks at this model, they could say, okay, the fraction infectious depend on those two things, that makes sense. And, and then it's gonna, we're gonna have um, one or two other things too. Um, so we have this and then we're going to have, so we're gonna have a mean contacts per person per day um, for each susceptible. They have contact maybe with, imagine they have contact with 15 people per day. Um, and of those, let's say uh, two thirds are infectious, right? That would be 10 people per day. That's 15 times two thirds or 10 um, uh, per day. People, contacts with infectious people 
oh my gosh, 10 people per day contacts with infectious people. Now we want to figure out the risk that a given susceptible will get infected. Well, if they have contact with 10 people, 10 infectious people per day, this times this, what do we have to know? What's the final bit of information we have to know to know at how much risk a given susceptible will, will be at issue? We know they're having contact with 10 infectious people per day. What do we need to know? The probability that each of those contacts with the infectious people will do what? Will infect them, will transmit infection to them the chance they'll get infected. So if they're wearing a mask, maybe they'll be a lot lower, right? Um, uh, if they're vaccinated, it'll, it'll be lower. Um, maybe if they wash their hands quickly, it'll lower it a little bit at least. Uh, if there's good ventilation in the area, they have a HIPAA, HIPAA filter, a HIPAA filter um, for good quality air um, uh, filtration, it may lower it some. Um, if they're engaged in social distancing, it will lower it. They're nearby the person, but they're further away. So if we want to capture those effects, we need an assumption about the, its probability of transmission, but it's not just an overall problem, it's per, what, what, per discordant contact, okay? Okay, you, know, you may say, oh, that's a mouthful, and I agree it's a mouthful. But the idea is that it's per contact between a susceptible and infective, not any old contact, not, not a susceptible and a susceptible. It's a particular type of contact. And I'm, I'm having problems with screen real estate and um, I'm probably, you know, no wonder I'm a professor and not a real estate agent. Okay, um, so, so there we go. And I'm gonna give it some more, more, more leg room. Um, here we go. Um, and, and we'll futz these things around. Um, okay. Um, so now we're, we have all the pieces we want. We're gonna specify this as 0 0.1, okay? 0 0.1, okay. Um, and um, uh, that's, uh, that's good. Um, so we're going to put in place here. Um, uh, so each, each uh, contact between a susceptible and effective will lead to uh, a probability 0.1 of getting affected. And so we're gonna have a total, uh, a total chance a given susceptible will get infected. Given, given that they have contacts with, mean contacts per person per day with anyone, and then a, the fraction infectious of those who are infected, um, say 10 per day with infectious people times the probability will give an approximation to the probability per day they'll get infected. It's not a probability, it's a probability per day. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna call this, the term uh, is force of infection. You might as well learn this, uh, uh, this term because it will likely appear on the final, um, force of infection, okay? It's a very basic term you'll hear. If you go Google it and um, you'll, you'll find tons of references to it with COVID-19. So the force of infection here, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, some people may have to leave, but we're literally within two minutes of getting this running. It's gonna depend on the probability of transmission per discordant contact, um, the mean contacts per day um, with anyone, and the fraction of those that are with infectious people. So the idea is, again, if they have 15 contacts per day and two thirds are with infectious people, they have 10 contacts, with infectious people per day, each of them has this probability of transmission, 0.1, um, then we're going to have a total probability that uh, is approximated as the multiplication of those. So I'm gonna give the formula here. This is another dynamic variable. It's going to be the following. Mean contacts per person per day, that autocomplete is your friend, control space or, or option space or, or command space or mumble, whatever it is on your platform, okay? Mean contacts per person per day. Um, that's what this one is. Times fraction infectious. So maybe that's 15 per day with anyone times the fraction infectious, two thirds. So then we have 
15 times two thirds, which is 10. Uh, for each of those, we have a probability, probability of transmission per discordant contact. So maybe each of those we have 0.1 and they have a chance, a probability per day of, of one per day. It's like, man, they're gonna spend an average of one day before they get infected. That would be really, really bad. Um, so um, I'm gonna actually lower this uh, probability of transmission per discordant contact a little bit, very likely, or else we're gonna see it go gangbusters. But let's, let's, let's do it as it is now. And, and we're going to connect that up to this guy. The force of infection is gonna be the probability per day a susceptible, a given susceptible gets sick. This is gonna be the chance per, per unit time they get sick, okay? Um, the chance per day. So this formula is going to be susceptible, there we go, times force of infection. There we go. Um, this is gonna be like, they have a 10% chance per day, 0 0.1 per day of being infected. That's gonna be uh, susceptible here. Uh, mm -hmm. And times this, because how many people are going down here? Well, if it's a 10% chance, each one of these will get infected. 10% of them are going to flow down here per unit time. Okay. So if there's a thousand people here with each has a 10% chance, it's going to be a hundred people per day flowing down here. Okay. Um, uh, and we should be able to build this model up here. And it's a happy camper. Um, does anyone have any questions on any step I did here? Because you're stuck in some sort of way before I run this model. Uh, I apologize if I missed this. What uh -huh. did we set as the default value for mean contacts per person per day? 15. 15, okay, thank you. Yep, and mean latent time was uh, two. Mean infectious time was 10. Um, probability per transmission per discordant contact was 0.1, okay? Uh, in initial population, whoa. Oh, no, no, don't give me that. Uh, initial population size was 1.2 times. Um, Can you show the force of infection formula one more time, please? Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, so it is uh, right here. Um, it is basically this times this times this probability. So um, I can, you know, I can show, show it to you. Um, in, in kind of long form, um, there it is right there. Um, it's this guy, think 15 people contacts with others per day overall, uh, think, and then times the fraction of those that are infectious. If you multiply these together, you get their number of contacts per day with infectious people, right? Um, if half of the people they bump into are infectious and they have 15 contacts overall per day, they have 7.5 on average infectious. So the, the first part of this is just a multiplication of these and then it's times this probability. Um, uh, that in fact it's, is a bit of a, a approximation but it's a very common one and we'll use it. Um, that's the force of infection. And what this gives is a chance per day that this a given susceptible will get infected. Um, they're mixing with this many people in total, this fraction of those people are, are infectious and each of those confers this chance of infection. Okay, um, now I'm getting a, um, a, a complaint here that um, it is, oh, it needs to depend on susceptible. I need to add in a link to this guy. There we go, boom. Now it's a happy camper. Um, notice there was a little, there was a little kind of X over here. Um, Okay, so uh, any other question anyone wants to ask right now before I run this? Uh, sorry, uh, do I need, uh, do we need a prevalence of uh, infection? Uh, the prevalence is this fraction infectious. This is just another name for prevalence. Um, so uh, normally I would call this prevalence, but with this group, I call it fraction infectious. It's a fraction of the overall population that's infectious and that's, that is the more technical term for that is prevalence. And probably next time I'll change it to prevalence. Okay. Oh, yeah, I was just I was just using a term they would recognize. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to run this. And what you'll see is infection spread. Um, and there we go, the number exposed are going up, the number infectious is going up, and the fraction that are infectious is going up. If we look at the number who are infectious, we could press this button and we'll see, oh my gosh, it, Omicron is spreading. It's, it's rising, it's rising exponentially. Um, and, you know, are you age as patients waiting in the hallways? Yesterday, there were 50 people waiting for the wards who had gotten admitted uh, formally, but couldn't be accommodated in the wards because they, there was no beds available. And now it's starting to come down, it crested, and now it's coming down. Uh, the number of people um, getting infected or, or becoming infectious per unit time is less than the number leaving. So it's draining that. People are recovering faster than becoming infected. And as they're recovering, there's fewer and fewer infectious um, to infect new ones. And so you have even fewer getting newly infected and, and it's coming down. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our first infectious disease model. And we have a simple situation depicted here. Um, this is our baseline. We'll call this baseline um, experiment, um, but we could, we could create a new experiment. Um, we could do, for example, copy this one and paste it, for example. Um, and we could say, you know, um, uh, strong mask use, right? Um, something like that. And, and what would this impact? Mask use might impact, which parameter might it impact in this model? Can anyone say? Which, which probability of transmission. Yeah, the probability of transmission. So for this scenario, we don't modify it in the model. We modify it in this scenario. The probability of transmission per discordant contact would go down to 40% of, of its normal values. And instead of being 0.1, um, it will be 0.04. And I'm basing this on some mask studies. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll... Uh, so, so instead of being 0.1, uh, which was its default value for the baseline, it's now 0.04. And if we run this thing, um, if we ran the baseline, we should have noted like how many people um, uh, were infected at the peak. We should have noticed that um, by clicking on this. So I could have recorded, I'll kind of fast forward here. And it looks like at the peak, it went up to about... Um, uh, 700,000 people infected. <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of scary, eh? Um, remember, everyone started susceptible. Let's go look for strong mask use. Strong mask mandates. Here, they, here we go. We're going to simulate the effects of a really good mask mandate. And um, we have a very good widespread compliance to masks like they do in some communities in the north. And they've really rallied around it. Let's see how far it goes up now. Um, it's rising, it's rising, it's still going up into the thousands. Uh, let's see how far far up it goes. Oh, it's turning around around now 500,000 or so um, is where it's turning around. Um, so we've brought it down through good mask use by maybe about 200,000 people, um, uh, fewer uh, that were infected at the peak. We've spread the curve. Um, now, what we haven't looked is, is the total number of people recovered changed? Like, are the total number of people ever infected, is that lowered? Or is it just that they're spread out? That is something you could look at for a little exercise I'll be giving you, okay? So this is a model. I'll be posting it. I'll be posting my version of it. But it should give you a bit of a flavor on, you know, building up models in any logic. And, and more importantly, this idea that models are about more than data. There is data here. There's assumptions about, you know, about um, the population size and the mean time people spend infectious and the number of contacts they have per day and the probability of transmission from a given contact. There is data, but it's the structure of the system that often makes uh, a much more profound difference. The data is kind of tweaking around um, those, those assumptions. And if we added another flow, let's suppose, uh, we were to eliminate the flow from infectious to recovered, or we were to have people go back directly from infectious to susceptible, 
or we had a, a waning of immunity from recovered to susceptible, it would totally change the behavior much more significantly than if we just tweak a parameter value. Models are about structure. The regularities in structure dictate regularities in behavior. And this is what we've seen from the model. This is a precise characterization of a certain theory of, of the development of COVID-19 in a person and its spread. Uh, it's a particularly abstract theory here, or stylized theory, but it's, it's, it's concrete enough we can simulate it. And we could say, what does this mean? I can't simulate this in my head. I've been doing this for 32 years. I can't simulate it in my head. Um, that's not something humans are good at. Um, I can recognize all sorts of patterns and, 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 and having query into patterns, I could think very flexibly, but I can't simulate this in my head. For that, we turn to a computer. And computers are, are really good at doing lots of dumb things very quickly. And by using a computer, we can lickety split, get a, um, you know, get an understanding of the behavior uh, of a model like this. So uh, this is our first little model we built up. Um, you've seen some about any logic, you've seen stocks as accumulations, and there's some feedbacks here, some feedbacks associated with balancing feedbacks for these, the drain, you know, the bigger this is, the faster it drains and the less of it, and some positive feedback, some reinforcing feedbacks, the more infectious, the larger the fraction of infectious people, the higher the force of infection, the more people get infected, and ultimately the more people that become infectious. That's the vicious cycle that leads to exactly this uh, initial, uh, this initial uh, exponential rise that we see in the model, and that sadly we see outside uh, our doors at this very moment within the fair city of Saskatoon. Um, this is the initial rise. And then we start getting, as it plateaus, uh, other feedbacks really becoming dominant, particularly this recovery feedback. And now we see the recovery feedback dominating. The more people that are infectious, um, the more recovery there is, and that draws down the, the infectious people. And now, and you notice it's at a slightly different slope, and we get recovery of the fair city of Saskatoon from the scourge, ladies and gentlemen, the scourge of Omicron. Okay, that's your first model, and you'll build on it for some exercises uh, before our next class. Thank you very much. Any oh. any questions? Yeah, yeah. Ask something. Like, uh, like, for example, if I messed up some stuff for the first exercise, like that we yeah, did I'm gonna just be providing now. this example, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uploading that to the to the class site to the canvas site. I mean, like, I like this, if, if this lecture is recorded, I can kind of like, you know, do it a bit more slowly, just like, for example, pausing through the lecture and then 